Hi there. So this video is going to talk about the role of mutations in the p53 gene that lead to cancer. And to talk about mutations in p53, we actually have to talk about the structure of p53 in terms of its protein structure. So we'll get to that shortly. So to review, p53 is a tumor suppressor gene. So what does that mean? Well, tumor suppressor genes are genes that um, are the breaks for the cell cycle. So they can stop the cell from going through the cell cycle. And actually for P53, its function can also uh, enable triggering a DNA repair as well as apoptosis. So not surprisingly, P53 is um, non-functional in almost 100% of human cancers. And that occurs either through mutations in the p53 gene, and about 50% of human cancers have a mutation in the p53 gene. The other human cancers, um, there are not mutations in the p53 gene, but there are mutations or other dysregulation events that occur in proteins that regulate p53. But in virtually 100% of human cancers, p53 is not working. We're going to talk in this video about the mutations that occur in the p53 gene that make it non-functional. For us to talk about that, first I just want to talk about transcription, um, no, uh, tumor suppressor genes, right? So most tumor suppressor genes, um, and if we're talking about ones that are diploid, they're on your autosomes, you have two copies of those genes. And in uh, human cancers, you would think, what kind of mutations would you find in a tumor suppressor gene? You would find deletions sometimes, um, and that is true. Many tumor suppressor genes are deleted in human cancers. So you can see I've drawn here, one copy uh, has a deletion, the other copy is fine. And actually, um, you can your cells can survive fairly well for many tumor suppressor genes if one copy is still present. For example, the RB gene, RB is a classical tumor suppressor. Uh, cells can do okay with one copy of RB intact and one copy deleted. For most tumor suppressor genes, both copies need to be inactivated in order for the cells to barrel through the cell cycle. But it turns out that is not the case for P53. It's a little... Uh, strange in terms of the way it acts in terms of a tumor suppressor gene. How is it strange? Well, for us to talk about that, we first have to talk about P53's function and structure. So recall that P53 acts as a transcription factor, binds promoters, turns genes on. Uh, transcription factors in eukaryotes, uh, many of them act as dimers. So here I've drawn a promoter and I've drawn two transcription factors binding a promoter and you can see they are forming dimers. There are two uh, proteins there together binding promoters to transactivate the gene. Many uh, human transcription factors function this way. Uh, here's an example of a transcription factor called AP1, which consists of two proteins, a FOS protein and a June protein. So this is actually a heterodimer, and there are many genes that have AP1 binding sites, and the AP1 transcription factor, which again consists of FOS and June proteins, binds promoters, turns genes on. And we've talked about uh, in previous lectures of other transcription factors, such as beta-catenin, which is a protein that binds to another protein called TCF, that is a heterodimer that acts as a transcription factor, E2F and DP, those are proteins, they are transcription factors, they work as heterodimers to transactivate genes. So what about P53? What does it do? It forms homotetramers. So here um, you can see all four subunits of this tetramer are made of P53 molecules. So above there, we were looking mostly at heterodimers. They had different components. Here, for P53, when it functions as a transcription factor, it works as a homotetramer. All four molecules are P53, and they tetramerize, and all four of them are binding to the DNA. Let's explore a little bit of the structure of P53 before we now start talking about mutations. So here, I've drawn out the structure of the P53 protein, the primary structure, so um, from the N-terminus to the C-terminus of the protein. Uh, P53 is approximately 400 amino acids long. And so let's break down uh, the domains of P53, because this is going to become important when we talk about mutations in certain domains. So the first 100 amino acids of P53 contains two uh, domains. 
Uh, one is the MDM2 binding domain. So if you recall, MDM2 binds to P53, and when it does, it transfers ubiquitins to P53, allowing P53 to be destroyed by the proteasome. So MDM2 interacts with the first 100 amino acids, approximately, of MDM2. No, of P53. Sorry about that. MDM2 binds these amino acids. And if you recall in previous videos, we talked about regulating the interaction between P53 and MDM2. And that regulation uh, occurs in serines um, in the first uh, 30 amino acids here of P53. If you recall that P53 can be phosphorylated on serines. It's like a serine 6, serine 9, serine 15, serine 20. And when uh, those serines are phosphorylated, then MDM2 can't bind P53. Um, so this region here, there's a lot of regulation that goes on via phosphorylation that regulates the interaction between MDM2 and P53. Uh, the second thing that's found in this region is uh, the transactivation domain. So transcription factors, the way that they work, not only do they bind DNA, but they also have to recruit the uh, transcriptional machinery that includes RNA polymerase to come to the DNA and begin transcription. So the first amino, 100 amino acids of P53 contains the domains that bind the transcriptional machinery that actually will transactivate a gene. The uh, center 200 amino acids, from amino acids around 100 to 300, that is the DNA binding domain of P53. So the three-dimensional structure when P53 folds, this region interacts with specific nucleotides in promoters that allows P53 to land on those promoters, bind to them, and transactivate the P53 target genes. And finally, the last 100 amino acids contains the tetramerization domain of P53. So this domain allows P53 to interact with other P53 proteins. So I'm going to draw a promoter there, and I will draw some P53 molecules on it. So there are four of them. And so if we think about where the domains are located when we fold up P53, um, each P53 has a DNA binding domain, and that DNA bind binding domain is in contact with specific nucleotides in the promoter. And you can see all four of them interacting with their DNA binding domain domains with the DNA. Um, all four of them have tetramerization domains. So those tetramerization domains are binding um, the other P53 molecules in the tetramer. And finally, all four of them have this transactivation domain, which would bind the RNA polymerase uh, machinery or allow it to be recruited to the uh, promoter and turn on this gene. Now let's look at how mutations affect P53's ability to function as a transcription factor. So I have drawn here a P53 protein. Most mutations that occur in the P53 gene are missense mutations, also known as point mutations, and they're specifically in the DNA binding domain of P53. So how do these mutations affect the P53 protein? Right, Just changing one amino acid in the DNA binding domain actually can have a very profound effect on that protein. It will not bind DNA properly. And if it doesn't bind DNA, it can't function as a transcription factor. So one nucleotide change leading to one amino acid change can ruin the function of a P53 protein. It won't bind a promoter, won't act as a transcription factor. Well, that's okay, right? The cell has the other copy of P53, right? We have two versions, we have two alleles of P53, one on the maternal chromosome, one on the paternal. The other one should be able to work just fine, correct? Well, turns out, no. And let's see why that is. So, again, we're talking about mutations in one allele and not the other allele of P53. So I'm going to redraw my um, P53 genes here. The top one is uh, the one that has one point mutation in the DNA binding domain, and so it makes a protein that does not bind DNA. But the other version is not mutated, so I've drawn it there, and it binds DNA just fine. So it turns out that one mutation uh, in the top version of P53 gene is going to ruin everything. And let's see how it's going to ruin everything. So instead of me drawing my cartoons um, with uh, more uh, detail there, I'm just going to draw 
two versions of P53. The top one in red, that red circle, that is a P53 protein that does not bind DNA because it has a point mutation in the uh, DNA binding domain. The bottom version is made from the wild type P53 gene. There's no mutation and it. it binds DNA just fine. So let's see what's gonna happen in the cell that has just one mutant version of P53. So the mutant version makes mutant protein. The normal version makes normal protein. So what happens when these proteins assemble into tetramers? So maybe you're starting to think about and see, oh no, what's gonna happen here? So let's say four random P53 molecules form a tetramer. And think about the possible combinations of P53 molecules that can form tetramers. Let me just grab four random ones. So I grab uh, two mutant and two wild type P53 proteins. So this uh, tetramer, is it going to bind a promoter? It is not because all four of them are required to have that DNA binding domain intact to properly sit on and bind the DNA. Those point mutations in the mutant version will uh, negate the ability of the tetramer to bind the DNA, will not bind. So now think about, well, how many tetramers can form and will any of those tetramers actually bind DNA? So let's think about uh, tetramers that have just one mutant P53 protein in it. The rest are from the wild type. Turns out that tetramer will not bind DNA, will not transactivate genes, will not work. Well, that's not good. Because if you think about all the other tetramers that could form, even with just one mutant version of P53, none of those are functional. They will not bind to promoters. They will not turn genes on. This is looking bad for us, for the cell, right? Because if you think about all the possible combinations of tetramers, let's say there are tetramers that have uh, two mutant versions of P53 protein and two wild type versions. Well, again, if one mutant version is not going to bind DNA, two mutant versions will not bind DNA, right? Uh, I'm running out of room on that slide, so I'm going to move to this slide here. Let's think about other possible, possible tetramers. How about three mutant DNA proteins and one normal? Well, of course, that's not going to bind DNA. Um, maybe you think, uh, I've realized that I left out um, uh, two of the tetramers that actually are half mutant and half wild type, so they're actually drawn like this. Uh, so now I've got 14 tetramers. None of them can bind DNA. There are only two more possible tetramers. One made entirely of mutant P53 and one made entirely of wild type P53. Now that one that's made of completely wild type, that one will work. That one will assemble into tetramers. That one will bind to DNA and it will turn on P53 responsive genes. The problem is that only one sixteenth of tetramers are functional when one version of TNA, one version of P3 is mutated, which means 15 out of 16, or about 94% of all P53 tetramers are non-functional in the cell. So, going back to the model of mutations in P53, if both of your P53s are wild type, that's great. Once uh, one mutation occurs in one version of P53, in the DNA binding domain of that one version, now that version will be dominant over the other version. The mutant version will be dominant over the wild type. And you recall the terms dominant and recessive, for learning a bit in genetics. So this is a dominant mutation in that version because the mutant version now will uh, express its phenotype, if you will, over the wild type version. So the mutant version dominates the wild type version, and not only does it dominate, but it negates the wild type version. So we call this type of mutation a dominant negative mutation. So mutation in one version of the gene will negate the, the other version of the gene in terms of its function, right? That bottom version, P3, it's not mutated at all, but when it makes protein, that protein is unable to function properly, as we saw on the last slide. It is very rare that you would get any functional tetramers. So, um, thinking back to P53's function in the cell, P53 uh, is activated and will turn on genes in response to DNA damage, abnormal cell cycle entry, low oxygen or nutrient levels, 
And so cells need P53 in order to be able to arrest the cell cycle, turn on DNA repair genes, and then also turn on proapatotic genes if the repair is too great. So cells need P53 in order to um, properly guard the genome. That's why P53 is known as the guardian of the genome. So if one version of P53 is mutated, then P53 is unable to arrest the cell cycle it's unable to trigger DNA repair and trigger apoptosis. So in cells that have one mutation of P53, actually the rate of mutations net increases because P53 is unable to stop the cell cycle. It is unable to turn on those DNA repair genes and cells uh, prop keep going through the cell cycle. They won't stop. Um, because there's DNA damage, and they propagate that DNA damage to daughter cells. Uh, and even though you have DNA damage accumulating, these cells will not trigger P53-dependent apoptosis because P53 is unable to bind those promoters and turn on those proapatotic genes. So that is why P53 is such a, a central player in cancer biology. It, uh, it, really, is need to be, it really needs to be in the cell in order to, to sense DNA damage, to stop the cell cycle, and to trigger apoptosis. And when one version of P53 is mutated, um, P cells are in a very bad state here, as you can see. So hopefully now you can appreciate why one version of P53, one allele of it, when it is mutated in a very specific domain, the DNA binding domain, will actually cause this dominant negative um, phenotype in cells that leads to um, and increases the rates of cancer.